very happy to welcome you at Politecnico di Milano. Um, it's uh, our technical university. Um, we have uh, two campuses. Uh, one is uh, here, uh, Austin this event, and another one is uh, in Bovisa, very close by. Uh, we are a technical university. We, um, we love to study, research. Uh, we do teach uh, with a student at the bachelor level, with master level courses. Uh, uh, we have PhDs, uh, um, a lot of researches and uh, we are very happy to be part of this uh, consortium for this Erasmus Plus uh, project. Uh, we have uh, one year ahead of us. It's uh, our third year of, our, of the project. And uh, so far it was uh, an incredible and uh, joyful uh, uh, journey together with our colleagues and researchers uh, with this uh, great uh, topic, which is uh, forestry, urban forestry, and uh, how to engage uh, with different um, um, students, uh, um, technicians, uh, researchers, uh, and how to uh, progress uh, uh, both uh, in, uh, in knowledge, in knowledge sharing, uh, and producing knowledge, uh, and possibly to, uh, to plant trees uh, eventually in order to change uh, our urban environment in a, a greener, healthier, and possibly happier, um, livable and sustainable way uh, of uh, living our cities. Uh, we have a um, great uh, event today. Uh, I would uh, like to thank Sofia Paoli, particularly uh, she's been uh, uh, working uh, very much on uh, on on this event, and uh, I thank all uh, the panelists uh, and uh, particularly Ersaf, uh, which is uh, co-hosting with us uh, this um, this event. And um, without any further uh, hesitation, I would give the, the floor to Laura uh, Gianporcaro, which is uh, going to present. Um, what are uh, the issues and what is uh, the project uh, you forest and what has been so far? Thank you Thank so much, you. Lara. Thank you. Lara. Thank you to everyone. Grazie, Sofia. Grazie, Maria Chiara. Uh, thank you to Poly Me. It was, this was my university. Uh, this year is uh, 160 years the university has been founded. And uh, we can say we're quite proud to be part of Politecnico and we are very happy to be part of this project that is um, in its title very important, from gray to green. And um, uh, this means we want to change something. May I ask you, uh, welcoming you, to think about a tree, just in your imagination, your favorite tree, and think about uh, uh, multiplying this tree and make it become a forest in a city. This is our goal. It's not very easy to do. Now we're going to explain why, but we want to go in that direction. So this alliance is promoting uh, um, an innovation capacity between many parts. This is the very important thing. We are a sort of community and you are taking part of it now being there. And uh, um, this is an interdisciplinary approach in Europe, urban forestation in Europe, but not just in Europe, we will see that. So let's start with I'm, I'm able, Sylvia. <laughs> that one. I'm not very good with the mind. Okay. Uh, what's going to happen to us? We're going to become urban people, most of us. Uh, the provision is very uh, clear. We're going to be 84% uh, among uh, uh, the urban population in the world to living in urban areas. So, uh, so many people in cities means. Uh, um, a lot of problem also. No, um, now we're, we can just already say that uh, we, we have uh, pollution probably, an increasing of pollution, increasing of uh, a social problem and so on. And the trends uh, is quite uh, difficult to, uh, to change, but we can work to make it uh, better. We can improve uh, a sort of re resilience that's coming from urban forests, probably. So um, we think 
um, we can make something with trees and by a good community that is sharing this culture, urban forestry. Um, this one, okay, okay. Um, to make such a big work, of course, I've said we have to be a big group and I'm working with a big team. Um, then uh, I will present you many partners during this uh, presentation, but I want to thank especially also Air 74, they are promoting this, uh, this project. Uh, you will know better them because many people are here, Ilaria from 84 and uh, Erika from Airsoft, that is the forest agency uh, in this region in Lombardy that is uh, working about promoting uh, a policy for agriculture and forest uh, uh, improvement. So uh, let's think about uh, when we are going to have a walk in the city and uh, uh, on a hot day, we really are looking for some shadow, for some um, a better place to stay. Of course, I think in your mind, you will have a park or a, uh, an alley with trees or a forest in the city. Why not? There is already many good examples of urban forests. And uh, you can really fear that uh, as you got uh, there, you feel better. Why? Why? Why uh, urban forests uh, um, make so big benefit? Because, of course, uh, um, we have uh, a climatic uh, improvement. We have a social benefit, uh, psychophysical um, sensation of being better, wellness. And, uh, uh, for example, here in Milan, we have uh, a lot of park. You can say that, Sophia. <laughs> we have quite a lot of parks and woods. And I can say as a student, when I was working here in Politecnico, my aim was going under a tree <laughs> to feel better. And uh, urban forestation was not such a big uh, uh, um, issue then. But anyway, uh, we really trust that the urban forest can help us in having a better uh, city. So, um, I'm a landscape architect, and when I make a project about planting trees, usually people say to me, oh, but that's complicated. It would cost a lot. Who is going to manage this project? And um, these are some of the issues that are making urban forestation difficult because um, people get scared about uh, having something that takes time to grow and make it effects properly and totally. So um, we have a sort of uh, wall that we have uh, to, um, to fight and to make it fall. Uh, Nadina is going to talk you about falling walls <laughs> and it will be interesting that the first step is to be able to imagine something different, to get the strength to go there. And the forest is such a, uh, a kind of project. So it's a, a kind of seed um, our symbol, this kind of uh, leaf uh, with the city inside, with windows inside and doors, is a very nice uh, uh, way to communicate. Um, you forest, uh, first of all, is a, a way to be together, nature and people, and to organize it to support this change. Of course, uh, uh, we have said the height related cost, uh, uh, the long term engagement, uh, and uh, the way uh, it's, um, we need an inter interdisciplinarity. So it means uh, many people going together and uh, make it work. So that's it, quite difficult. But anyway, um, there is another big problem that this project would like to um, solve, or at least uh, to face that we have a lack of uh, professionals or practitioners that are really able to promote and to realize uh, new forest initiatives. And here we are, <laughs> the community, you will know many people today, other university and professionals, EFI, there's Jan, there's Ioan Pino, there's Florence Florido, um, many people that are really working on this uh, focus. So, um, it will be interesting to see that uh, Youth Forest uh, is uh, a tool for supporting students, uh, practitioners uh, to implement this culture of urban forestation. And uh, uh, how we can we do that? Well, of course, uh, work together. Working together is the first step. Working together on this uh, uh, knowledge alliance. This is, uh, as uh, Sofia Paoli introduced you, an Erasmus Plus project uh, for the European Union. 
And uh, the interesting thing is the biodiversity of this project. Could we say that? Because we have a, a lot of partners, very different. And so we are sort of um, biodiverse uh, people. <laughs> we are coming from university, professionist. Uh, so there are companies, uh, business companies, uh, university and public institutions, researchers, and so on. And this is a very, very important starting point. Uh, talk together, have idea together, and try to make mm, real things happen, like the planting campaign I'm going to tell you after. So here's the panel about how many we are. <laughs> we see Airsoft, I've introduced you. Uh, the, um, this agency is a public body and is uh, working since a long time on forestry and agriculture. And there is ETIFO, that is a very important startup uh, about communication also uh, managing European project, and uh, uh, we have uh, four universities working together. That's very interesting because uh, it's uh, a very um, improving uh, uh, interlinking. So we have Politecnico from Milano, of course, uh, WAB, the University of Barcelona, IUA Pino is online. We have the University of Brescia in uh, Romania and the Trinity College of Dublin. And uh, these four universities are um, making uh, by now um, a MOOC uh, course, then there will be a Sophia to present it, and uh, a capstone course that is going to start very, very in the, the few weeks. And we have uh, six research and networking organizations, Agresta, Creaf, Green City Watch, we, for this uh, um, company we have Nadina here, uh, and the Network Based Solution, Forest Design, AFI, that is the European Forest Institution. So you can see we are really uh, a lot, uh, quite uh, um, different from each other, but this is the richness of our project, being together in different way uh, with specific uh, uh, skills. Uh, of course, there is a sort of, um, of mantra, three-step approach, join, learn, green your city. And these are our main uh, um, words we can uh, always repeat to get uh, uh, straight on to the project. Let's discover them. Join means that uh, um, urban forest in itself is something, is something interdisciplinary, so we need to have a sort of networking for consulting, for engaging different stakeholders. And uh, the very nice graphic we have, uh, thanks to Edifor, are showing uh, very clearly that uh, um, Euphorus is connecting people who are looking for better solution in urban forest. And this is mainly obtained through an alliance that is called the Euphorist Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, that is quite easy to reach. Uh, you need a click, then we will show you how to do that. In this alliance, uh, the researchers, practitioners, professionals uh, can exchange knowledge and uh, best practices. You know, someone said uh, to know is power, knowledge is power. So power to change things through this very big global uh, chain of people trusting a euforestation like um, something that really can um, change the, the great green, as we started to say. So uh, what is join, contact and share? Through this alliance, just have a look, it's a big alliance now. We are around 100 members and not just in Europe. So we're quite proud of it, uh, thanks to Jan that is working a lot about it and also other partners. And it means that we can contact major in experts in urban forestations. You can have uh, news about uh, the very um, newest project in uh, urban forestry, and you can share your publication. You can have uh, increasing your visibility. And this is really creating a community in which you can um, have a sort of uh, um, hope and uh, basis to, to work on uh, urban forestry. And one of my favorite words, personally, is learn. I'm also a teacher. And I've been working a lot with Politecnico di Milano about uh, um, projects for improving landscape. And learn is the starting point for everyone. I think everyone, when we get up, we say, what I'm going to learn today for me. And this project is a learning project. 
first of all. And uh, Politecnico is making really a big job with the other partners, uh, with the other um, university, but not just university, because our MOOC course is made by all of us uh, that uh, contribute to make uh, the experience of EUFORIST uh, uh, very effective. And uh, so, first of all, EUFORIST has already produced high quality learning materials that you can get quite easily, always with that click I've said to you. And um, so, um, you can have this specifically these um, learning sources. You can find detailed stakeholders analysis and training needs assessment, an urban forest in blueprint. And then, so he is going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a strategy policy document on urban forestry and uh, cases studies uh, studies twenty ca um, case studies of uh, innovative urban forestry because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to see what is happening really. And uh, here we start from the last but not least uh, these cases uh, in which you can see some example in here. But uh, of course, uh, if you join uh, the website of Euphorist, you can have uh, this fact file and uh, really have a deep uh, um, information about this very interesting project that give us the strength to believe in urban forestation because it can happen. And these very important tools that uh, are the re result of a very hard job of our team and uh, these three um, online documents are reports about uh, uh, why we need uh, urban forestation, how can we do it in a very innovative way, and uh, um, it, these three reports are a sort of inspiration of our uh, goal. And what about again uh, about uh, learning courses? Uh, there will be a specific uh, presentation, so I will be quite fast. Mm, these two courses are very specific and the, the beautiful things for me is they are specifically basic MOOC is open and can really be uh, a starting point to approach urban forestation. Uh, here we have uh, um, Alessandra Tomazzini that is working so hard about that together with Sofia Pauli and um, to Maria uh, Chiara and uh, this, it has already started this course a lot of people engage in that. And uh, um, so the next step uh, that is starting next week is the Capstones course that is more specifically dedicated to uh, 150 students and coming from the four universities. So it would be really an, uh, uh, can we say, a challenge for us to manage all that uh, people together to work on a real project uh, about real place where to plant plants. After this um, capstone course, uh, there will be also a specialization program in a summer school, uh, one week uh, in Milan and one week in Barcelona for uh, the best uh, 20 students. And that will be really, really great uh, work to be together and to plan a urban forest. But we don't forget practitioners and professionals. That is a, but this is very important because we want to have a project working already with people that are facing urban forests in their job. So uh, we have these um, workshops for professionals in local languages. AirSub is organizing one in Milan, and um, WAB is organizing with CREAF another one in um, Barcelona. Brescia, we have forest design that is going to propose one of these uh, workshops. And uh, so we have uh, these uh, um, other tool to engage professionals in the urban forestation. So what about Green Your City? That the other uh, um, statement we have in our uh, agenda, and uh, that this uh, will happen with this uh, gorgeous event that we're trying to do very hard <laughs> is a European simultaneous planting campaign. Simultaneous is the word as engage us so much <laughs> in four different cities. The cities are the ones uh, who has uh, the universities, Milan in autumn, Russia already in spring for climatic reason, but also it would be another spring, uh, another autumn campaign in planting, Dublin and Barcelona. So um, people and plants together in different parts of the world. And what is a planting campaign? Well, in my life, I've been planting a lot of trees and it 
it's a, such a great sensation when you put the hand in the earth. You take the small plant and you put and uh, you change a place and you know that uh, this little things you are doing is going to bring a big change in the world. And so I have to say, I'm so happy there will be such experience open also to common people, students and other uh, that uh, could really participate in improving our um, environment. And so this planting campaign are simultaneous, but uh, are um, really related to the place they're going to be made. Um, and uh, this would be a, a real contribution to our uh, urban uh, context. Okay, so I think I'm quite fast. I hope you are not be sleeping so much. And I'm just to say one thing that is uh, uh, something that I've heard when I was a student in this place and my, my professor, Darko Pandakovic, he said, remember what San Bernardo said, a falling tree makes more noise than a growing trees and a growing forest. So my aim is uh, a bit of forest that grow and uh, better be the you forest, Rose, be you foresters with us. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Sofia Paoli and I work for uh, DASTO here at Politecnico di Milano. And I'm going to tell you about the learning opportunities that we have developed uh, in the project uh, You Forest. Um, so um, we, um, in this project, we have uh, created and developed uh, high quality learning materials uh, uh, super tailored on urban forestry. And we did this uh, starting from um, analyzing what's um, in, in the high educational uh, institutes of the world right now about urban forestry from researchers. And we also did a training needs assessment to, to understand uh, uh, what is really lacking uh, in uh, in this field uh, in terms of uh, of learning, and we built from that uh, our our courses. Um, so, as Lara already introduced, uh, the um, courses are three different uh, uh, steps. Let's say uh, the first one is free and accessible to everyone, as uh, uh, maybe some of you already uh, know and tried. The second part is a specialized course uh, uh, just for students of the partner universities. And then um, a part of the best uh, performing participants of the of this second par part will be um, uh, invited to an in-person innovation program. So going deeper in these courses, um, the first part, the MOOC, uh, the title is Nature in the City, Turning Knowledge into Urban Forestry Practice. Um, it has started at the end of November and it will end in uh, uh, May. Um, it's a course with all streamed lessons. And uh, the, the main goal, the main aim of this course is uh, to uh, create uh, a learning, uh, uh, learning contents that are um, greatly transdisciplinary. So uh, the courses span from urban design to forest ecology to socioeconomics, and it's an introductive uh, course to, to the topic. So it is structured in uh, some interdisciplinary weeks. Uh, the core ones are on history of urban forestry, uh, urban forestry planning and design, um, urban forest ecology, socioeconomics, governance and community engagement, and entrepreneurship and innovation. And then of course, we have the introduction part, the final assessment, and we organized also uh, two live events on um, some case studies. So as you can see, we have uh, a very big group of experts teaching in this uh, course. And uh, uh, again, this is, uh, in order to uh, have the most transdisciplinary uh, um, uh, aspect uh, of uh, urban forest. So we have uh, architect, ecologist, uh, um, GIS experts, uh, and both from universities and from uh, uh, private businesses uh, and also practitioners who, who teaches the, the subject. Um, this is the landing page of the course in the Polymi Open Knowledge uh, website. Um, so you can uh, enroll from, uh, from this page. And as you can see here, it gives you some information on the, on the starting and ending of the course, the length, uh, uh, the estimated effort, uh, and the, the language, uh, which is uh, English. 
uh, going a little bit deeper inside of the of the course, this is how it uh, it looks like actually in uh, in POC. Um, each each of the week is composed uh, of uh, many different lessons. This, for example, is a video lesson. Uh, so you have a video and then the transcript of uh, of the text uh, of the expert uh, uh, explaining the the topic. Then we have some additional uh, resources that are downloadable, and these are very uh, different, uh, of, of a different nature. This can be scientific papers, uh, articles, uh, videos, uh, um, YouTube links. Uh, it's very, it's very wide. Um, other other activities that we uh, embedded in the MOOC are uh, more active, let's say, with some uh, um, uh, questionnaires or activities as for example this one in which we ask which are the benefits that uh, your uh, preferred uh, three or four is provides to society and now we, we start seeing some nice uh, results or for example this uh, other activity in which we asked uh, what is the oldest urban forest in in your city and from this um, slide uh, we can see how wide is the is the U forest uh, uh, learning team uh, um, worldwide, exactly. And this is a Zoom also to Europe. Um, so I'm going to present now some uh, results of these first two months, which are uh, to us very good. We are very, very happy about that because we have more than 600 enrolled participants and almost 600 are active actually. So they have been looking at videos and uh, uh, doing some of the activities and already 33 earned some uh, the, the final certificate. And as you can see from the graph, uh, uh, we have uh, participants from really all over the world. And this is uh, exactly what we wanted. This is a, a very nice uh, goal that we achieved and we are very happy about that. Um, again, some other results. 40% um, of the users are between 26 and 35 years old, so uh, quite young. And more than half of the users have a master or a PhD, and more than a half are workers. Uh, so this gives us also some information about uh, who is uh, looking for uh, learning uh, activities on urban forestry, which are not just students, but also practitioners and workers uh, uh, of this field. So the second part of the learning program is uh, um, a specialized course for the students of the four partner universities. Uh, it's called Winning Your City, Develop Your Urban Forestry Project, and it will start uh, very soon. Uh, the ending month is June. Um, it is composed of four different modules. Also in this case, there will be streamed lessons um, and the course is limited to a number of, uh, of participants as it's a very specialized uh, training with a project-based approach. Uh, this means that uh, each one of the, of the students will have to develop a project related to urban forestry. Uh, the projects are very different. So depending on which um, university you are uh, from, you will develop um, a different project. So for example, here in Politecnico di Milano, the project will be about designing an urban forest. Uh, in Barcelona, the project will be assessing urban forest ecosystem services through earth observation and local data. In the Transylvania University of Brasov, uh, it will be about mapping and monitoring the dynamics of the urban tree uh, or forest ecosystem. And in Trinity College Dublin, it will be about strategic leadership of the nature-based enterprise. So as you can see again here, um, it's very clear how the uh, interdisciplinarity of the subject uh, uh, is very important and uh, um, very, very strong. One uh, interesting thing that we uh, achieved to do is that the lessons of all the four universities will be accessible to all the students uh, uh, who uh, will apply to Greening Your City course. Um, the third part and uh, last for, for the students is the innovation program, as I, uh, as I said, and it's uh, dedicated to uh, a small group of uh, best performing participants of the, of the e-learning course. Um, and this is um, 
very specific intensive 14 days training that will be delivered in person. It will be uh, one week in Milano here and one week in uh, Barcelona. Um, These best performing per uh, students uh, will receive uh, uh, grants in order to uh, uh, participate uh, and to do these uh, two weeks uh, in the two cities. In the next months, uh, we will also develop the practitioner workshops as uh, Lara introduced. Uh, so uh, check the website for the updates uh, and to be um, with us in this journey of uh, learning on uh, urban forestry. So thank you very much. And I will now leave the floor to Florencia and to Joanna. Hi, thank you. Hi. Oh. I will share my screen. Okay, so I will stop here. So can you see the presentation and hear me okay? Yes, we yes. do. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, dear team, <laughs> for inviting us here. We are so proud to finally be able to present uh, this report with uh, Joanne, who is uh, uh, the, di di the director of CREAF, uh, but also he's a professor at the University of Barcelona. So um, even though the report is uh, 70 pages long, <laughs> it's very thorough, uh, we would like to focus on what's, uh, well, what we believe is the most interesting uh, yummy <laughs> thing. Um, and we can relate to what Lara said uh, in the beginning of uh, her presentation, that is, uh, we want to make a change. So with that in mind, uh, we need to focus on uh, how to make that change uh, innovatively. So um, we will uh, uh, structure this presentation uh, uh, with these questions. Uh, that is, what is innovation in urban forestry? Why do we need to innovate in urban forestry? How much innovation do we need? Where does urban forestry innovation happen? And who can innovate in urban forestry? So what is innovation in urban forestry? Uh, it may seem like a very astra abstract concept, but uh, the bottom line is that is something new. Uh, it can be a process, a result, or even an innovative culture or mindset um, that happens within the urban forestry discipline and that addresses uh, uh, the urban forestry challenges that are related to economic, uh, social, cultural, or environmental dimensions. We so, uh, why do we need to innovate in urban forestry? The thing is, um, there are several challenges that uh, uh, need to be addressed. Uh, these challenges you might, uh, you will find the um, the uh, description with examples in the report, uh, but they are related to. Um, every aspect of uh, the relationship between uh, um, cities and their forests and their urban vegetation, which are social aspects, uh, environmental aspects, and so on. But also we need to innovate, um, not from uh, this context-specific uh, uh, local point of view, but also we have to bear in mind uh, we have um, very serious um, uh, global issues uh, and we need to meet the sustainable development goals. So um, innovation in urban forestry uh, will allow us also to focus on or to address these goals. And the last but not least uh, reason is to, uh, of course, develop the urban forestry profession. So um, these are the challenges that I was talking about. Uh, you will learn more about it, more about them in the report. But um, it's important to bear in mind that um, they are very uh, diverse and they are interlinked. There is they, they are not like separate from one another. At one point, they are all uh, touched <laughs> together. Uh, 
So how much innovation do we need? Um, according to the uh, analysis that we made of uh, 20 case studies in Europe, um, <clears throat> most of the most of the innovation in urban forestry happens uh, within an incremental or complementary uh, degree of novelty. That is, uh, to sum it up, there are small changes. You know, there's something that already exists and you make a small change. And that is innovation. You don't have to be radical or disruptive to innovate. Uh, but uh, what we find, uh, what we found is that uh, there's still uh, a lot of um, well, there's missing this disruptive and radical uh, innovation, uh, and we believe uh, there's there's an opportunity here uh, for those of you who are thinking of innovating in urban forestry. But bear in mind that small changes are also innovation. So uh, you might wonder. Um, where do I uh, innovate? Because okay, we are asking you to innovate, but uh, where do you, where can you do it? So uh, in the report, you will find that uh, we um, uh, explain uh, several innovation typologies according to this analysis that we made of the of the uh, case studies. So um, you can focus, for instance, on improving growing conditions for urban vegetation. And we give you some examples here, but there are many more. You can, for instance, um, develop new tools to monitor daily conditions. You can um, improve soil quality and soil life. Uh, you can focus on land management and so on. You can also uh, focus if you are uh, specialized in social disciplines, you can solve social concerns related to urban vegetation. Um, for instance, uh, fight to uh, have green spaces that are inclusive and accessible, or also you can fight against um, green gentrification and provide housing stability. This is very difficult, I know, but there's room for innovation here. You can also uh, focus on building knowledge and um, uh, improving the use of technology. For instance, uh, you can uh, study uh, what are, would be the best species uh, for your city uh, to be planted. Uh, you can study noble habitats and emerging ecosystems. And then uh, you could also focus on uh, governance and new models of governance for like like inst like uh, mosaic governance. Um, you could um, uh, work uh, towards having uh, hybrid land ownership and management. And last but not least, uh, there's uh, room still <laughs> to have uh, to find uh, novel ways of funding uh, innovative uh, urban forestry projects and also for economic development, um, for instance, uh, in the fields of bioeconomy or to um, promote uh, um, the creation of jobs in the green sector. And then who can innovate in urban forestry? So uh, the answer is that anyone here could innovate. Uh, you don't have to be uh, um, urban forestry engineer. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be a forestry engineer. You don't have to be a biologist. You can be, uh, like myself, a communication technician. <laughs> you can be um, a lawyer. Um, I mean, the urban forestry field is so multidisciplinary that uh, we need all the disciplines working together. And if you'd like to uh, have more information on this, you can visit uh, this uh, article we have written. You can have, find the, the link down here. Uh, if you're interested in knowing how you could uh, help uh, develop urban forestry projects. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Brilliant to hear people who's clapping for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, 
now we should uh, have the break. I don't know if Joan is going to uh, present uh, some part or, okay, perfect. Um, so yes, we are a little me, bit- Let me add just something, uh, um, just just to, to, to highlight that in, in, in border disciplines uh, as, as urban forestry, uh innovation is especially important and, and will be especially uh, useful for creating new new opportunities and new jobs so this is a, a, a innovation is inherently uh, associated to these uh, new uh, disciplines growing in the borders of of, of previous disciplines like like uh, urban forestry so uh, uh innovation is uh, especially important to be to be addressed in this part Thank you very much, John. Uh, I don't know if somebody here in the room has any question or... Okay. Okay, so yeah, the first question was about the how to participate in the Alliance. And uh, yes, please go to our website and uh, get in contact from there. And then the second question is, the elephant in the room is economic pressure on city administrations. What uses public support of urban forestation if the administration bows to industrial and investment lobbyists? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> um, so I may try. <laughs> um, so thank you, Janet, for this, uh, this, this question. Um, one of the issues is definitely uh, on, particularly on urban forestry, on how to, um, to tackle uh, land use and uh, the, the, the actual cost of the land, which is uh, highly competitive in urban areas. So I, I don't know if this is the kind of uh, um, question that you would like to, to be addressed. The, uh, from, from our point of view is that uh, um, we have uh, and we have um, we still uh, uh, tackling this challenge in which uh, we feel the urgency of having uh, urban forestry we we feel the urgency of having trees and shrubs uh, and nature in our cities but uh, again um, uh, as soon as we need to park our cars uh, uh, we do want to have uh, these parking lots uh, just in front of the house. And this is, uh, uh, I'm, I know it's very far from, from your uh, question, but uh, I, I feel it's uh, related in the sense that uh, um, from our side, from one side, uh, we have uh, um, urban development that uh, needs to happen and uh, uh, is going uh, to happen. Um, and uh, uh, city administration needs these uh, for the many reasons, such as the growth of GDP, uh, position of our city in uh, our um, worldwide market. And on the other side, we have uh, these uh, ecological crises, uh, um, not in, at our doorstep, but, but, but already in the room. So um, we, we really need to both work on uh, uh, making people understand and let ourselves uh, be ambassador of uh, including green system in our uh, cities in uh, now, and so make ourselves ambassador of, of this change. And on the other side, uh, work on uh, uh, integration between uh, the different uh, land uses uh, by creating a system in which allows uh, uh, to have uh, um, either uh, the stop of uh, uh, soil consumption or um, regeneration of, uh, of, of soils uh, and uh, uh, construction of new forest in all the spaces that the city uh, allows and um, enhances and uh, possibly integrates uh, new waves uh, of uh, nature within our dense and packed environment. So I really hope uh, I tried and make the case, but uh, that's what we aim to do. So this is one of the biggest issue. Are the presentation going to be shared after the webinar? Yes. Are there still opportunities to get involved from the UK, Scotland and link PhD study with policy relating to 
new local plan and greening on halted and brownfield space. You can I still uh, uh, join the module at this late stage? Well, the MOOC for sure, uh, the capstone, it's, I mean, the second part of the course is uh, dedicated to students for, of uh, the four uh, U4 universities. So, uh, but you can link PhD study with a wider nectar of uh, the researcher that are working. So if you drop us an email uh, to any of us, uh, we will uh, interconnect to the researcher that are working uh, in this field uh, in order to create uh, uh, knowledge sharing, which is one of the issues that we are trying to make. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the wider network, and I'm talking for everyone, I guess, I uh, would be very happy to um, discuss and uh, share knowledge on these issues. Okay, perfect. Okay, shall I proceed? Yes, please. Okay. Good. So I'm going to talk about our um, latest um, New Forest report, which is unlocking the potential of urban forests and about developing local urban forestry action plans. So as the as mentioned earlier, this was a third um, report in a, a series. And uh, the idea was to talk a bit more about how you can achieve uh, forest management at a fairly practical level, and also how you link the strategic with the local context. So I'm going to just run through the different sections of our document. Uh, myself and uh, Juliet and Rick from the European Forest Institute were editing the material and uh, we had to combine lots of information and make it sort of uh, fairly, fairly coherent. So introduction, so what, what was it about? What was the purpose? The aim of the report is to provide background and practical guidelines to policy and decision makers at local, national and European level for the development of effective urban forestry action plans. And it was to stimulate and simplify the adoption and implementation of nature-based solution approaches in urban areas. So what is an urban forest? Uh, that's our, our starting point. So FAO in 2017 defined it as integrated interdisciplinary, participatory, and strategic approach to planning and man managing tree resources in urban areas for economic, environmental, and social cultural benefits. So if you think about it, there's lots of components. So we tend to think of urban forests as maybe trees in a park or within a city center, but it's much more varied. We've got trees in uh, residential neighborhoods, in streets, We've got trees and parklands. We've got uh, areas of maybe more extensive semi-natural uh, forests on the periphery of cities. So all these things constitute the urban forest. And uh, I want to think about urban forestry as a green infrastructure approach. So it's very important that, that we have these linkages from maybe the uh, initiatives within the more built up urban areas so, for example, that might be street trees, it might be green walls, it might be uh, planting along watercourses, going through the uh, sort of peri-urban areas and linking to the wider countryside. So, if you like, we've got everything from the, from the urban through the peri-urban to wider regional landscapes. So, why do urban trees and urban forests matter? Okay, we're hopefully going to answer that question. So let's let's look down at the end of at the scale of an individual tree. Let's think about the services it produces. For example, we know it's there's lots of social benefits. You know, it provides an attractive place to live. It, it provides uh, shade. Uh, it provides pollination services. And down below the soil, obviously, there's lots of benefits in terms of how it manages uh, soil uh, moisture how it retains stormwater, decreases uh, excess runoff. So at an, at an individual level, there's lots of ecosystem services. And on an urban forestry scale, we're scaling that up. We're thinking about the, the whole of the city and its, its hinterland. So we're thinking about the services that provide. So the inner forests provide cooling. We know that urban heat island effects are 
a big problem. They absorb atmospheric pollutants and provide access to nature for stressed urban dwellers. If we go into the peri-urban areas, they help to filter our water. They help to reduce the uh, excess runoff during storm, storm events, and they provide important places for recreation. And then think about the, 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 the forests that are further away. So their role, for example, with carbon sequestration, providing uh, valuable timber resources, medicinal components, and biological diversity. So all these elements provide um, sustainable development goals and their realization. So we can summarize that. We've summarized it in our report into social, economic, and environmental benefits. Uh, we know there are many, uh, some of them perhaps less talked about, for example, reducing crime rates and, and violence calms people down, uh, creates uh, economic opportunities, health benefits. We, we're very familiar with many of the environmental benefits, especially reducing uh, urban heat island impacts that I, I just mentioned. And also the link to health is a very, very important one. So the positive link between urban forests, uh, urban greening and human health and well-being, it's been well proven by many, many studies, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, and uh, evidence-based. So is it cost efficient? You know, so uh, money counts. We know, we know there are many costs, for example, establishing the trees and managing them, uh, for example, land acquisition, planting. We know often there's a lot of administration costs. Uh, for example, staff time, funding applications, training, public liabilities, and then uh, informing the public and educating the public, for example, to signage, uh, uh, providing access infrastructure, education programs. So there are many costs, but what about the return upon investment? So uh, we looked at that. Uh, we looked, for example, at different cities. So for example, the city of Lisbon, 8.4 million uh, euros of services from trees, uh, street trees, for every euro invested, we get 4.5 euros back in terms of ecosystem services. Uh, looking across the, the pond, across the Atlantic, city of Pittsburgh, for every uh, euro or dollar there invested, we get three, three euros back. So uh, that provides 2.4 million worth of services. And then looking at the UK, um, some work done, for example, by Forestry Commission Scotland uh, showed that uh, for every uh, euro invested, then we get 5.6 euros back in terms of benefits. But there is an issue that the people who derive the benefits aren't necessarily the people who make the investment uh, at the early stage. So there's a mismatch there that we need to be aware of. So how do we actually develop an action plan? Um, we identified different uh, steps. So for example, looking at societal needs, uh, mapping and auditing of the resource. We need to define our principles and goals, develop detailed proposals, and then we need to implement them. And we need to make sure we monitor and evaluate the, the work that we do and then actually communicate that good work to other people. Uh, in terms of the governance, it's very important to think who, who are the stakeholders, what sort of uh, system do we have? So quite often we find, for example, that we get very regulated systems where the local authority or the government do things on behalf of citizens. And there's a, but there's a whole scale up to grassroots initiative where local people actually take action. And we look at collaborative uh, models in between that. So stakeholders can be very varied. They can be local associations, groups of professionals. They can be the business sector through corporate social responsibility schemes. Uh, different uh, community groups. So they're all stakeholders that can we can involve. And I want to think particularly mosaic governance was mentioned earlier. So I think we move beyond this straightforward top-down approach to the fact that we need to involve many actors from across different local authorities, from civil society, from business, from communities. And that way we add value to what we're doing. 
And uh, looking at an example of that from my home country in Scotland, for example, here on the right, we've got the Central Scotland Green Network, uh, a network of 19 local authorities developing strategic uh, green infrastructure, which is part of na national planning policy. But how does that relate to this community woodland, which is uh, on the left here, which is a local initiative? How, does, how do the governance structures relate? How can these synergize and add value to each other, which is very important? So we need to link local and regional approaches uh, to make those connections. And we need to map and understand what there is. So for example, here's a land use uh, classification from Brashoff in Romania, uh, work that's being done there. Or from Scotland, we have uh, forest habitat networks showing how biodiversity rich areas can connect through corridors, which can add greater connectivity for both wildlife and for people. We need to think about the tree planting opportunities, what spaces are available. So are they on new development sites, for example, along streets, uh, green streets, in private gardens perhaps, or in vacant and derelict land? So we need to think about all of these different uh, opportunities together, not just one or another. And in this respect, the 33300 rule, which has been developed by uh, Cecil Koninendijk, is, is a very great opportunity. So he's suggesting, for example, there should be three trees visible from every home. There should be 30% canopy cover in every neighborhood. And we should be 300 meters from the nearest park or green space. So a very helpful guide, which can be easily understood by policymakers. And uh, we need such uh, straightforward rules. We need to integrate biodiversity, for example, retaining veteran trees, uh, removing uh, invasives, uh, managing the understory, looking at old varieties of fruit trees, uh, how we can retain individual species within our urban forests, and thereby create green networks for wildlife and for people. So both are important. Uh, that can be across regional landscapes, through river corridors, through peri-urban forests, or through little bits of urban planting, creating attractive places. And then we need to manage and maintain that forest through involving stakeholders, through providing appropriate training, to be aware of risks, to manage pests. So many practical aspects we can undertake. And uh, we need to have action plans to integrate uh, policy at the different levels. Uh, so we have industry standards and codes of practice. We address skills gaps and we have mechanisms for sharing innovation and technologies. So we've talked about innovation and I'm going to not really say so much about that because it's been mentioned already, but it, we need to link these different dimensions, the social, the ecological, the economic and the cultural through uh, information technology, understanding ecology, through planning and socioeconomics to deliver the SDGs. And uh, innovation in practice may be different things in different places and may mean different things to different people, but there are many ways we can improve that innovation. And we've got case studies you can read in the report. You can look at that in detail. We mentioned the roadmap we need to follow to get there. So. Uh, we can read about that in the innovation report. And we need to encourage and incentivize best practice. I've mentioned some uh, approaches there. So funding, uh, case studies, awards. We need to have government schemes which actually encourage innovation through incentivization and involve lots of different stakeholders, thereby creating rich and colorful urban forests. And then to communicate that message across the various stakeholder groups and thereby make the connections. So uh, join the Alliance and you can explore these connections further. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Mm. Thank uh, you for inviting me. <sighs> We have some questions. Maybe we can go through them now. Um, 
So let's see which one. Uh, uh, this was Florencia answering. Uh, um, the knowledge of urban forests in African societies, especially Tanzania, is still little. Do you have a consideration of starting any projects in Africa countries? Mm, are you asking this as uh, to the Euphorest uh, project? So I, I can I can provide a very general uh, discussion on, um, uh, for instance, uh, FAO <coughs> is uh, working uh, on on this uh, subject. Uh, we've been uh, uh, we as Polymi have been working together with them on the first regional uh, event that was held uh, two years ago now on uh, urban forestry. Uh, we know that there are some uh, projects which are, for instance, uh, one in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, in, uh, in the city of Freetown, and uh, um, there are projects which are now happening in African countries. Uh, at the worldwide level, uh, in um, October 2023, there will be a World Forum on Urban Forest, uh, in which uh, we may, um, of course, we all invite you to, to join uh, to, the, to this event, and hopefully there will be um, uh, also project and, and um, experiences that uh, will be uh, shared also by African colleagues. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe I could add there, but the F FAO guidelines are, are really exceptionally good in terms of illustrating the diversity of urban forestry across the globe. And um, certainly, for the next uh, World Urban Forestry Forum later this year, they're collecting uh, data on the state of the art of urban forestry in the across the various continents. So, you know, information is there, but you know, I think, you know, we have we ha we have to accept the fact that each part of the globe will have slightly different problems, slightly different solutions, and there is no one size fits all. We have to look at the the local dimensions, uh, the local challenges, and build those into projects. So it, you know it has to come from local stakeholders, uh, perhaps working with people like ourselves who can provide some advice or support. But local solutions are often the most appropriate. Thank you. So I'll go through the other questions. So uh, we'd like to suggest our local gover government to get involved by learning from experts and maybe skip some unnecessary steps in urban forestry development. Where can we point them? I suppose they wouldn't be keen to explore opportunities of involving in this project. Well, the, guide, the guidelines that we just mentioned are a, a good step to, to, to check out. And there's also other information available, for example, from the FAO uh, you, you can look at, but you know, it, it depends on, uh, I mentioned this sort of hierarchy of participation. And what you'll find is that some cities uh, and some cultures, you know, they, it's for much further down that uh, ladder of participation. Other cultures are much more inclusive. So I think you have to, you know, get some idea of how willing to speak to stakeholders your local authority are. And whether there's, for example, lobby groups in the area or NGOs, others you could cooperate with because I think one person David against Goliath is is maybe difficult but when we people work together and and uh, you know uh, benefit from these synergies then there's a lot of scope so I would try and involve diverse partners and maybe approach your local authority and see if there's an interest and a willingness to have participative approaches it's got to start, the change has got to start somewhere. And you could be the agent of change. Thank you, Ian. Um, I will go through one more question then we need to go ahead with the presentations. But uh, Daniel is asking, would carbon offsetting be an interesting way of funding urban forests for the EU? I think carbon offsetting in, in there, are, there is scope, but certainly in urban forests, it's maybe more limited because the areas are relatively small. 
I would suggest. And I know that carbon offsetting also can have a number of negative consequences sometimes, for example, in terms of social equity and the, the ability of all stakeholders to benefit. So I would say it can have some benefit, it can have some uh, position to play in this, but it's not, it's not a panacea. And it's actually the, tot the multiple benefits of urban forestry that are, you know, its strong point, the fact that it can reduce you know, the impacts of uh, climate change. Thank you, Ian. So um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, maybe we can go through the next, these questions at the end uh, in the Q&A. Um, I will now, would like to call here Erika Malghizi, Ilaria, Doiman, Maria Chiara Pastore for the next presentations. Thank you, Sofia. And uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Erika Alghizi and uh, I work uh, in AirSAF. I am a forestry technician. And um, I'm going to start uh, um, sharing with you uh, what is uh, AirSAF uh, and uh, what uh, does. Uh, AirSAF uh, is a regional agency for services to agriculture and forestry and uh, is a public authorities uh, and work uh, with in partnership uh, with uh, universities, uh, research institutes uh, and uh, other public uh, organizations. And uh, of course, uh, is a partner and leader in many European projects uh, and uh, in forest uh, uh, above all. ERSAF is an organization of excellence for Italian forestry and uh, is involved in many urban forestry works, especially in the, the metropolitan area of Milan, which is one of the most uh, urbanized area in Milan. And uh, since its birth, uh, AirSAF uh, has been foresting uh, more than uh, 200 hectares and planted more than uh, 400,000 trees. And uh, in urban forestry filed, uh, AirSAF is involved uh, with uh, its uh, own staff in uh, planning and management, in uh, tree planting, and uh, also in maintenance which is uh, one uh, of the most important steps uh, after uh, the tree planting uh, because uh, it uh, helped to guarantee the success uh, of uh, a new forest. Uh, working with uh, many, uh, uh, many other public uh, um, organizations, uh, we are also involved in the creation of parks uh, and park services. Uh, and uh, in the care of uh, many other forestry works, uh, such as uh, wetlands. But uh, also we are involved in educational activities. One of uh, the characteristics of uh, AirSAF is uh, that uh, all the plants we use in our works uh, are produced uh, by AirSAF itself uh, in uh, its nursery in Curno, near Bergamo where uh, native forest plants uh, are grown uh, uh, by certified seeds uh, from uh, local natural forests. And uh, so uh, this is uh, what uh, Hersaf do. And uh, this is uh, only the last step uh, of uh, a very long uh, process, uh, the administrative procedures. And uh, now I want to tell, to explain you this, uh, this process. Uh, as I said before, uh, HERSAF work uh, with uh, other partners uh, thanks to agreements. Uh, and uh, these agreements consent HERSAF to be linked with uh, other um, organizations, uh, with uh, the other stakeholders involved uh, in our uh, project. Uh, uh, principally institutions uh, uh, which are promoters, uh, uh, owners uh, of the uh, area available, and uh, they are municipalities, uh, the region itself, uh, or um, 
uh, park uh, authorities uh, and many other association. And um, thanks to Colfold Tenders, ERSAP works uh, also with uh, makers and uh, eventually also with uh, citizens. So here are some uh, low referment that uh, regulate uh, how are the possibility <laughs> of uh, work with other uh, subjects uh, uh, thanks to agreements. So the administrative process uh, is uh, made uh, uh, by different steps. The first one is the promoter's proposal. Um, is uh, the moment in which uh, the promoter uh, share with us uh, his, um, his idea of project uh, and show us uh, the land available and uh, even if uh, the amount uh, of the project. After uh, verify the feasibility of uh, the project, uh, we pass uh, to the drafting and sharing of the agreement itself. Uh, this agreement has to be approved uh, by her side uh, from the board of directors, uh, and um, but we need also the approval of uh, the promoters and uh, of the uh, owner land, the land owner. Uh, so the last uh, step is uh, the implementation that start uh, with uh, the planning and then uh, the realization of uh, the project. The convention con uh, has different uh, uh, contents, general and specific purposes. Um, general purposes are the um, objectives of uh, our project, what uh, we, are, uh, we have in mind to, to do. And the specific purposes are uh, uh, the way in which uh, uh, we are going to reach uh, our goals. Uh, for instance, with the creation of a new, uh, new woodland uh, or uh, a wetland uh, uh, and uh, the amount uh, available. The convention uh, has uh, many other uh, contents, for instance, the maximum duration normally is for is three or five years, because we have to consider after the uh, realization of uh, our works uh, that uh, we have uh, the maintenance uh, operation. And so uh, five, three or uh, five years. Uh, other contents are who does what and the time frame, uh, the privacy, traceability, and uh, other things. But uh, the most important is uh, the signature of uh, the subject involved. And uh, after uh, this uh, long process, uh, then we can start uh, to plan and to plant uh, our trees. And so I. Thank you. I finish here. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Erika. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, so I'm also very glad to be to be here with the people in presence and also the the people online. Um, I'm Ilaria Doimo, uh, and I'm I'm working with. Uh, Etifor, which is a spin-off of the University of Padova. Um, and today, uh, so as Etifor, we are also partner in the Euforest project. Uh, but today I'm also here on behalf of the of one um, uh, uh, part of Etifor. So is a is a great team that works on this project that is called Wow Nature. And today with the examples of Ersaf, Wow Nature and Foresta, we wanted to give you some examples on how different institution and um, association and organization can actually, you know, promote and foster uh, urban forest and forests uh, in different in different ways. Um, let's do like this. Yeah. 
Um, so as uh, before we had the presentation by Ian and also by Lara, I can cut you know, on, the, um, on the benefits of, of actually urban forest and forest because we all know um, that uh, forests are a great nature-based solution to tackle uh, some of the uh, global challenges uh, that we are facing. Uh, but um, forest and urban forest, um, let's say, are also one of the, you know, ecosystem that are most affected by uh, planetary crisis, climate crisis. So what we really strongly believe is that we need to, you know, protect, uh, restore forest, but especially also try to find innovative and sustainable ways to fund these two activities. Um, so while, uh, while keeping an eye on the global challenges, uh, we also, let's say, faced some uh, more local challenges, so local for, for Italy, but we also understood that these challenges were valid and spread among other contexts uh, around Europe and internationally. We uh, have divided and grouped uh, these challenges in mainly two uh, yeah, two groups with two different stakeholders. So on one side, uh, <clears throat> we, we found that uh, forest and landowners um, had actually uh, often a lack of awareness and knowledge of the value actually of their land and their forest, uh, but also they have difficulties in accessing the funds to promote the, uh, the growth and protection of forest. And also uh, sometimes difficulties in actually developing, managing uh, sustainable forestry projects. So actually difficulties in uh, finding capacities and also local network of, um, of expertise. Uh, on the other side, on the side of uh, investors and single citizens, um, we, we have faced you know, difficulties in for citizens also to have uh, really local and close by projects. So projects that they can actually, you know, see and, and touch and monitor. Uh, also sometimes linked to that uh, lack of engagement in this reforestation uh, projects. And also um, the important point of having a trustworthy uh, partner and trustworthy um, you know, network of people working on reforestation project. So um, what we do to, let's say, to tackle all these challenges, we created, uh, the, the process were, was quite long. So for two years, we, we were brainstorming on how to try to match these different challenges and giving a, an answer back to these problems. Uh, but back in 2018, we developed this Wow Nature that is essentially a platform. So it's an online platform um, that enables, as we said, owners and, um, and land managers to find the people on the other side that want to invest, but also to support um, the project uh, and also vice versa. So um, the first project that we we have started and we had the, you know, the chance to test ourselves against to was actually a project uh, asked from the municipality of Padova. So a public institution were asking us, was asking us to uh, provide co-funding and uh, capacity to plant in the city in eight different areas uh, of the city. Um, so in this, this is actually, um, a screenshot of what you see in the first uh, page of this platform. Uh, this platform allows anyone, so people, association, company, organization, to uh, take their part and to contribute to mainly uh, two actions. So you can see here. So you can grow a tree, so actually uh, develop, uh, contribute to develop a new forest or protect um, an existing forest. Um, this is really what we have tried to do, so make things as easier, simple, and understandable as possible for citizens. Of course, for companies that want to you know, invest and support this project is a little bit more uh, complex sometimes in the sense that each company get in contact with us 
and uh, we have a team, so the team of Wow Nature that um, you know take care of each single company and try to match them with the most suitable projects according to their objective and and resources. Again, this is what you find in the website. So if you decide to support a new forest, uh, you can uh, you can click there and you find all the projects that we have. So you can you know select the projects. Uh, and also the three species that you want to support. Uh, more or less the same things happens if you want to protect an existing forest. The interesting thing that we are trying to develop is also to characterize a little bit this forest. So for example, for protection, we have, let's say, uh, yeah, flagship projects. So each forest is mainly focused on, uh, you know, one big uh, benefit. So for example, there are forests that are really important to, um, uh, to slow uh, biodiversity loss. Illegal logging is a really uh, important topic for us, for example, uh, wildfires, but also wind and extreme weather events. So uh, again, very quick on this. So how it works, uh, it is this platform that really is quite simple in connecting people owners and managers of the forest that need to support to people that want to you know make something uh, impactful and uh, do it like a meaningful gesture by adopting a tree is something very simple but uh, understandable by everyone and also by um, with uh, associating them with companies association and organization that want to implement corporate social responsibility uh, green marketing action and green uh, branding, but also all the, um, uh, the companies that are really engaged in um, uh, reducing their impacts and reducing, reducing their emissions. So how we do all this? Um, so Etifor, uh, Well Nature, as I said, is, a, is an initiative of Etifor, which mm -hmm. is a spin-off of the University of Padova. And I think uh, that the, the real added value, let's say, is that we are part of this bigger company. In this company, we have different streams, so different programs. Uh, so from sustainable tourism to nature positive um, economy uh, to uh, supply, uh, supply chain of food. So this constant, let's say, exchange of uh, information uh, and knowledge is really crucial for keeping up with, you know, innovation and science-based approach in well nature. Another thing that really, uh, let's say, we are proud of and we are uh, characterize us um, is that we uh, we really believe that um, in creating positive impacts, and we uh, we do that by following one of the most uh, strict um, and uh, high standard in forest uh, sustainable forest uh, management that is the uh, FSC standard so the forest uh, stewardship council standard so um, <coughs> the majority of our projects uh, actually are certified or are working to be uh, certified uh, and the certification is good for citizen but especially is good for uh, attracting the company, so attracting the company that want to do sustainable and uh, impact investments, uh, because the project in this way are really, you know, certified and all the impacts are um, monitored and assessed and certified. FSC, uh, since two years, also developed the uh, ecosystem service procedure for uh, certifying also the ecosystem services of the forest. Um, another thing is the, the approach of having close by, close to projects. So we really believe that also that um, uh, having uh, projects that can be close and reached by, by people, but also close to uh, the company that supports the project. Sometimes it's very important to them to, to, to be able to show that they are doing something positive for the environment that they have around them. Um, but also that is very important for us to um, being you know to to support the forests that make the most uh, can make the most uh, impact so that they can have high environmental but also social and economic impact. 
And um, the last thing, and I've already mentioned, um, we really believe also to, that it is important to engage people, so to create a little bit of, of change in their minds. So uh, we don't want them to stop uh, with the, you know, the act of buying and adopting the tree. We always, when possible, organize the tree planting event with, um, with the community. Um, and it's a very long event because there's a, a big part of you know, education before, then we pass to the, uh, to the act of planting. And then you are um, invited to remain within the community. Uh, so the, the online community is very active. You always give, um, receive updates of the project. Uh, but also, uh, let's say, other contents about uh, urban forest, uh, forestry, uh, and sustainable forest management. Um, then I will, you know, finish just by presenting some of our, let's say, flagship project in the in the website. As I said, you, you can find all the active projects. Uh, but just to let you understand what we what we are doing, this Bosco Limita is one of the first actually project that we have developed that is a sort of pilot and uh, you know research project for us because we are we are allowed uh, in this area to really experiment a lot of the things. Uh, what is really interesting about this area that you find in a, that you can see in the picture is that this was a this is a, a private land that is surrounded by uh, you know, agricultural land, and it was an agricultural land. So this uh, owner decided to do, do something a little bit re revolutionary. So instead of having crops, he uh, transformed the land into, um, into a forest. Uh, and uh, we did a forest infiltration area. So this forest is um, functional to really recharge the aquifer. Uh, and they are uh, serving, so with this forest, the agricultural sector, the local agricultural sector, and also the local community. Um, another project uh, that I've already mentioned is Padova Odue. Uh, so the, the, let's say the important thing here is that was, uh, was a, is a project on public land this time. Uh, in which the, the municipality asked us to, you know, support them in finding co-financement, um, uh, skills and capacity, but also uh, we really wanted to create areas for the citizens. So in here, the municipality was really keen to support and foster the participation of the citizens. So we had um, a nice, uh, you know, participatory and engagement process within this um, project. And the last one, um, this can be uh, really called a social reforestation project, is done in Burkina Faso. Um, and we did it with the collaboration of a local NGO and a local um, association of uh, women entrepreneurs. We have planted uh, species like baobab, uh, moringa, karite and other species to tackle mainly two problems, the food insecurity of the area. Um, and also to support economic development because they are working with uh, non-wood forest products deriving from this species. Like uh, they are producing uh, she butter and we are also <laughs> um, activated, uh, let's say a fair trade market and their products now are also sold here in Italy in some, in some shops. Um, these are just uh, some, some numbers, you can find it always update in our website. This is just to say that uh, we are active from 2018. So we are quite proud of the, of the number and especially the participation of, of people. Um, also this slide, these are just like a sample of our uh, partner and supporters. And I think the, uh, the interesting thing here is that we were able with this mechanism to bring some funds and money in a sector that traditionally, especially in Italy, is quite poor, uh, from companies that usually don't have nothing to do with forestry. So we are trying to, you know, uh, making some awareness and trying to move them from the usual uh, investments. 
And I will conclude here with the people. As I said, uh, wow nature is not just about the, the restrict people that work in wow nature. These are, yeah, more or less the entire team, more people are actually coming. Um, this is the entire team. And we are grateful for <laughs> this really biodiverse, as Solaro was saying, um, group of people. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm the, <laughs> I'm the white one there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would like to share with you some uh, um, suggest uh, some uh, reflections uh, on uh, a very uh, linked project to uh, what Ersaf has mentioned, but also on uh, what Ilaria. Uh, proposed uh, with uh, 84 and Wow Nature, and I'm starting. And my project, uh, in my sorry, my uh, presentation is about forestomy, which is uh, a project that uh, started in uh, 2018 with a very specific request uh, on uh, how urban forestry can contribute uh, to clean uh, the air. As uh, in uh, metropolitan area of Milan, we have uh, a very high air pollutions uh, uh, due to, um, um, of course, the um, urban uh, and uh, human uh, uh, presence and uh, its uh, impact, uh, but also on the orography of the uh, Pianura Padana system. Uh, so uh, since that, uh, we partner with the Città Metropolitana, Comune di Milano, Parco Nord, Parco Agricolo Sud Milano, Ersaf, um, uh, with a research that uh, we started uh, here in Politecnico, um, funded by Fondazione Falcon Sistemi Urbani, uh, with the aim to plant 3 million new trees by 2030 within the metropolitan area of Milan. Um, in order to do so, we uh, have the aim to involve the citizens, uh, association, public and private companies to contribute with actions uh, with a positive impact uh, um, on the land and to raise awareness on the value of tree and urban forestry as an essential contribution to the well-being being of the place. Uh, so uh, we started by trying to understand what are the conditions in which uh, we really need to plant our trees. So by doing so, we map the plant and the permeable and impermeable surfaces as a state of the art in which we need to understand not just where the soil is permeable or impermeable in the sense that we can easily uh, by condition to plant tree but also to understand uh, uh, where to act and also um, uh, where we need to work the most uh, to do the ceilings for instance. We understand uh, uh, we study the urban Italian effect and this is uh, a project that uh, Laboratorio di, Sim di Simulazione Urbana had carried on uh, before our project. So we try to partner with people that already were doing these studies in order to make synergies as, as this project is uh, based on a, a, a coordination among uh, different actors. And in this case, we try to understand where are the um, uh, places in which uh, the urban Italian effect uh, happens the most as well as the um, runoff. So where we have uh, most uh, of the issues related to um, non-permeable surfaces and uh, risk of floods. And then we worked on the tree canopy cover. So it is an estimate of the existing tree can canopy cover uh, in 2018 as a baseline. So the question was, where are the trees? Where is the tree canopy cover, which is uh, the, the surface of the, um, of the canopy of our uh, our trees, and this map is very important with us because uh, it doesn't uh, show where um, are the public trees, but where are all the trees and their canopy. And this uh, is relevant with us because uh, it shows also um, possible uh, private owner which uh, pub, uh, uh, plant trees in the past or are planting trees nowadays. So it's a, a very different management system. It's, it's by the private, but uh, this map also shows this kind of uh, uh, effort. Um, so uh, we, we went to the potential. So one of the, uh, as this is also 
it aims to plant trees. It's not just a study of other research. One of the biggest issues uh, that the public and the private uh, perspective were asking us, uh, uh, three million trees where? Uh, is there enough space? Because this is one of the biggest challenges. So uh, we worked on the potential. We started from the um, urban um, uh, forestry typologies uh, uh, from FAO. This, this is on, uh, uh, on the left hand side. Uh, these are the um, categories uh, that FAO uh, proposed in 2016 in, in their uh, report. And then uh, we worked on uh, uh, specific uh, case studies and on typologies which are uh, relevant to at least uh, uh, our uh, complex uh, Città Metropolitana system, such as we have uh, a lot of urban agriculture, um, um, the city is characterized by courtyards and gardens, uh, we have tree line avenues and square, either to we have it and uh, we really need to uh, imagine that the future is going to have uh, more tree land evidence and so on and we try to uh, find out these categories and on these uh, we have the areas of interest this is also very relevant to us because when we go and discuss with the municipalities and we say do you have space for urban forestry this, the answer is no but when you say uh, can you imagine to have a cycle path? Uh, uh, and they say yes. And then you, can you imagine to have a cycle path with trees alongside that? And the answer is also yes. So it's also a matter of uh, on glossary and how to present uh, what you aim to do and uh, which is uh, in reality what the cities uh, and the municipality can expect by uh, proposing not just uh, um, a change in, uh, in the perspective of urban forestry, but also change uh, in the topologies and uh, in the system which are already existing in the city. So public housing is one of the other issues. Uh, and then we, um, we work on, uh, on these typologies uh, on, on the land use uh, and uh, we map the potential. This is a, a kind of complex system in which uh, we uh, worked on the land use. Uh, we worked uh, on uh, the different um, uh, on how the trees can, can be actually implemented on, on the ground. Of course, a, a tree lined system is very different from a woodland. So the number of trees that can be planted in which of the typologies and we estimate a, a possible number. And we made also a, an online map, which is available on Foresta. I mean, this helps people to understand that these changes can be made within the city, not just farther away. Uh, so mapping the priorities, mapping the potential, but we really need to plant. And so we really need to know where the spaces are available for real. And so uh, since uh, three years, uh, uh, Giorgia Lentini, uh, Corinna Patetta, um, Claudia Parenti and Daniela Gambino have been working so hard in uh, building on a database and on um, working with the municipalities in order to understand uh, and to create a system, a liveable database in which uh, we stock uh, and uh, we uh, design uh, possible areas of intervention. So for uh, each of the municipalities, there are 133 municipalities uh, to the point 64 have signed memorandum of understandings um, uh, and they are, uh, um, so the, it's uh, an open call. So municipalities are answering to this call. They are not uh, obliged to do it. Uh, so they're uh, opening up a discussion uh, with, with us. We, we design and uh, um, understand which are the issues that uh, they have, wh where is the uh, actual um, urban planning system, if they are doing transformation implementation, if they have available land, and then is uh, done through a strategic design. And after this discussion, they sign memorandum of understanding within their Consiglio Comunale, which is the, um, let's say, official uh, uh, terms in which they engage with, the, with Forestami. And, sin and after that, we have uh, um, uh, availability of land, which is uh, always uh, changing in the sense that uh, since then, uh, they can always uh, add other uh, eventual uh, uh, areas in which they can, um, we can plant. Um, so uh, we do plant in the end. Uh, so to the, since uh, the starting of the project, we've been uh, designing and pl planting 41 interventional uh, in all the metropolitan area of Milan. 
this is a map that shows uh, which kind of intervention. Uh, more than that, we have uh, we collaborated and worked together with uh, Città Metropolitana, uh, which was uh, <clears throat> coordinating uh, uh, for a national uh, funds. We secured the nine projects. Uh, um, five of them have been already planted. Four of them are under uh, development right now. Uh, and uh, it's very relevant with us because uh, we just not secured private funds, but we coordinate and work uh, with um, uh, the uh, institutional entities in order to secure uh, public funds. Uh, how we do plantations? Uh, the plantation have been um, uh, done in collaboration with uh, social cooperatives. Alongside with them, uh, uh, there is a technical uh, committee um, in uh, which uh, Parco Nord, Parco Sud, ERSAP are working together. Um, the co social cooperative designs, uh, plant, uh, and maintain uh, the trees and in the intervention system. And now we, I just show you some of the different interventions that have been made so far. Um, one of the uh, biggest uh, issues that we see is that uh, in order to do so, we really need to work uh, on uh, um, cultural and uh, dissemination. Uh, uh, this is uh, seminal to, to us because uh, unless uh, we have uh, alongside with us, together with us, so it's an, an, uh, a long process of ownership and engagement of the different uh, institutions uh, and the citizens uh, uh, with us, uh, uh, this project would not continue. So the, the feeling and the sensation is that uh, until uh, uh, the citizens uh, uh, between uh, a parking lot and a tree, uh, choose a parking lot, uh, we are failing. Uh, we are failing uh, as a project, as a species, uh, and the uh, um, future will be very, very short sight. Uh, so uh, one of the biggest issues to us is to make people understand that trees and shrubs uh, and nature are relevant to our side. So we've been uh, working on um, a website which shows uh, in a nicer way and more <laughs> or a friendly way uh, what we do in terms of uh, make people understand of trees. Uh, we're promoting the project uh, with um, uh, with uh, different matters. Uh, we've been uh, working on advertising campaign on what is urban forestry and why it's so relevant with us. We have a school which is called, called Scuola Forestami in which we work with uh, different um, uh, schools uh, from uh, primary to until uh, uh, secondary school. Uh, we um, promote, this was last year, a uh, project called Custodishimi uh, that was done with Legambiente and, uh, and Ersaf. We, we gave um, uh, 2,500 small trees uh, to citizens who took care of the trees. And the idea was to uh, uh, pass the two ideas that trees are not just trees, but they are different species. Uh, so it, it, they are they are in different they come in different species they need have different needs and most of all they need uh, to be taken care of so you need to water them you need to make sure that they are under uh, shade somehow or under uh, the sun in other times so and uh, they can die so there is also a reality of it and uh, uh, so we also had an agronomist which was answering to the different question he received uh, like. Uh, 600 uh, emails, so for it's uh, a very uh, huge uh, um, uh, discussion that was uh, held uh, uh, towards the whole year. And um, in uh, we we gave we gave 2,500 uh, small trees. Uh, we opened the call for the citizens. Uh, in three days, it was done. So we could not have any other uh, trees, uh, small trees to give. Uh, but uh, we received uh, a lot of requests that should uh, um, uh, decline because uh, the, the answer was too wide for, for, our, for us uh, to give uh, enough trees. Uh, so this makes the idea that there, there is a lot of uh, um, engagement that should be done uh, with, with the citizen. We really need to uh, work on that. Um, I would wrap up. I think it's uh, most of the time. And uh, thank you so much for, for this. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, excuse me. <laughs>
I will leave the floor to Nadina Galle for our last presentation of today. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, before we get started, I want to invite all of you because it's me, me between you and lunch. So I want to invite you all to just particularly take a stand. <laughs> And everybody that's online, the 83 of you, I think, that are online, also, I encourage you to just stand up, just briefly, don't worry, and just give me, just give me a couple of these. <laughs> just, just shake it out, shake it out, move the hips, move it around, get that blood flowing to the head. I'm getting a little rosy, yeah? Okay, take a seat, calm down, I won't make you stand for the whole thing. Okay, I hope some of you online also joined us in this little exercise. Um, here we go. Okay, uh, which is important just to get our brains moving and shaking again. Um, so great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me today and not just today, but also the entire week. Um, it's great to be here over from Amsterdam in uh, Padua yesterday with, with uh, 84, today at Polimi, tomorrow at Polimi, and this afternoon at Airsoft. So thank you so much for having me, you Forest team. It's great to great to be here. Always great to come to Milan um, and enjoy some of this unseasonably warm weather as well. The sun was shining from the moment I got off the plane, which I can tell you is a big difference from Amsterdam. So I appreciate that. Um, okay, so to dive in, I want to again have you uh, join me in a little bit of a quick exercise, a little bit of a visualization exercise. And I want you to try and picture an asteroid belt of architectural garbage. Try and form a picture of what that might look like to you. Okay. Now join me again in doing it, but this time for a formless, soulless, centerless, demoralizing mess. Picture? Okay, and one more time. The greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. Any of you have a picture of what these three quotes might be describing? Anybody have any ideas? Well, it describes the place that I grew up. <laughs> Suburbia. <laughs> and let me tell you, it was a great childhood growing up in southwestern Ontario in Canada. Um, but this was a, a suburb that looked quite similar to the one that I grew up in. And maybe this is something that you can recognize. It's a certain form of um, wonderful urban development. That's a joke. Um, that uh, has seemed to kind of start in North America and really kind of make its way all over the world. Uh, this idea where we um, remove an entire ecosystem, put down all of the, um, thank you, put down all of the, um, the, the urban development and everything that we need. Let me just brighten my screen here else I can't see. There we go. Um, there we go. Uh, and then uh, nature becomes very much this idea of an afterthought where we then go in and, and put, as you can see here, that we still have a little bit of the lawns and a couple of the trees, but we put them in after. So it's this kind of bizarre way of actually developing our cities because we recognize the value of nature. We actually want it close to us because why else would we want to put in these backyards and lawns and trees and all these things, but we put them in later, which of course, from an ecological perspective is not the best way to go about it. Um, when I was 12 years old, I was introduced um, initially via book, and then I found out he had a documentary um, to a man named James Howard Kunstler. He's an American geographer, and he is also the one that all those lovely quotes from the beginning of the presentation were from. So he's this renowned geographer, urbanist, and in 2004 or 2003, he came out with this documentary, The End of Suburbia. So you can imagine me as a small 12 year old seeing this documentary, it was essentially like a horror movie because this movie goes on to tell me that the very, the, the very place that I called my childhood home was actually this, this, this place that could not survive. This method of urban development could simply not continue. It was too car centric. It was too far removed from what makes us human. So as you can imagine, I was terrified. Um, but I was quickly able to turn that terror into some form of 
a life mission, let's say. And of course, I couldn't give it words at the time, but I think looking back, for me, this is where a lot of these questions started. And after watching this documentary, I remember walking my family dog through these neighborhoods and having a little bit, starting to imagine, not just, oh, this is all bad, but starting to imagine ways that it could be different, ways that we could bring more nature into these areas, ways that we could actually build better places for both people and nature to live. Um, and that really inspired the rest of my academic journey uh, to initially study ecology and earth sciences, and then ultimately getting my PhD in ecological engineering, which is really this beautiful discipline that's relatively young, about 30 years old, that really brings together these two disciplines to try and figure out ways that we can not only build new, but also restore the existing nature that we have in our cities. Um, and the challenge, of course, is massive. We are currently undergoing the largest wave of urban growth in history. And that's something that's uh, going to continue to exist. Um, but it's a common misconception. And oftentimes we're confronted with that statistic you know, that the UN projects that two thirds of us will, will live in cities by 2050. Uh, and many places in Europe, of course, this percentage is already far over 80%, 85%. I know in the Netherlands, I'm Dutch originally, grew up in Canada. In the Netherlands, we don't really talk about a country. We basically talk about one huge mega city that is just has a little bit of agricultural tracks in between. There's this massive idea that urban growth is only going to happen in these very, very inner city centers. But that's, of course, not where, it, where it's happening. It's happening at the growth. We're having increased suburban sprawl. And it's specifically, it's not even really happening in the big Milans and Parises and New Yorks of the world. We're actually having a lot of this urban growth in small to medium-sized cities, the ones that we don't often see on the news. But these, these issues are especially relevant uh, to citizens living in those types of urban environments, much like the one that I grew up in, a little city of about... Um, 100,000 people, some hour and a half um, of Toronto. These are not the, the names of the cities that you hear about on the news, but this is exactly the type of places where regular people like you and I live, and these, this is really the, the forefront of a lot of these issues. Um, but to help kind of put into perspective just how much land of this type that we need to urbanize in the next little while, this is Milan. And Milan is about 181.8 square kilometers, if Wikipedia was not lying to me. So this is the land area of Milan. And we need to urbanize um, the equivalent of, uh, of the area of, of twice the area of Milan every single week to keep up with urban development. So what does that, or urban population growth, I could say, to, to house all of these people. So what does that look like? Well, in about a year's time, it looks like this. And by the turn of the century, so in, you know, what is it, 77 years, it looks like this. Oh no, the rainbow wheel of death. Honestly, I don't think it can handle it. <laughs> See the rainbow? Yeah. That's the worst. When you, you know the MacBook rainbow wheel? Once you see that. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Okay. That's... It was too much to yeah. handle. Yeah. Honestly, that's kind of funny. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so bad. It can't handle. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll do my best. Yes. But I think it's not. Oh, my gosh. That's actually it's can that's actually hilarious. Yeah. That's actually hilarious. That's a sensation. Okay. I did so I, I did this I did this example. Um I did this Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. I did this example with another lander. Okay, so I don't think we okay, you saw it briefly. I don't think we can go back to the slide because <laughs> the computer's gonna crash. But that's actually hilarious that that happened. And I think I have to say nothing anymore. I think this proves my point. <laughs> Um, so the point being twice the, the size, the land area of Milan every single week. That is the challenge that's um, in front of us. Is this better, Alessandra? Is the volume better? People online, let me know if you can't, uh, if you can't hear me. Um, 
Right, and uh, this is not an issue, of course, that that just Milan uh, is is dealing with. This is something that's happening all over the world. I thought this was a pretty confronting example uh, from Mumbai. Now, Mumbai has lost about in the last um, in the last thirty odd years. So, in the span of my lifetime, and maybe some of yours, um, has lost. 83% of its forested and, and wooded and open areas, 83%. That's how quickly some of this development is happening in. We're seeing it, I know that I've seen it in my own hometown. This is something that we can see in our, it's not something that our parents or our grandparents are talking about, oh, it was different back then. We're seeing this now in a generation's time and oftentimes even much shorter than that in periods of five to 10 years. So we're really seeing this challenge right in front of us, but that also means of course that the opportunity is ripe to do something about it, to do it in a different way. And unfortunately, as we're losing a lot of this urban development, what is that at the cost of? Well, as with the example of Mumbai, that is at the cost of, of course, nature, our open areas, um, the last kind of swaths of land that we might, the tracts of forest and the land that we might have between those urban developments. For example, in the US, there was a study from the USDA Forest Service that showed that on average, uh, the US is losing about 36 million trees every single year uh, in the country, specifically in its urban and peri-urban areas. Um, the example out of Sydney, Australia, was that over the last 10 years, more than 50% of its city councils have less trees now than they did just 10 years ago. And this at a time, of course, that we're talking about Milan with uh, 3 million trees that it wants to plant, a New York with its million tree campaign, Globally, of course, we have these trillion tree campaigns. So there seems to be this huge disconnect between the want, as, as Maria Cara was, was saying, there's this huge want in wanting to plant these trees. You can't keep up with the demand that you have from citizens, but at the same time, how do we actually do this? How can we actually make it work in our modern world? And I very much felt uh, both growing up, um, but also now still, they're, they're very much feels like there is this dichotomy, nature or development, one of the two. We can't and house all these people and maintain nature. Um, but what if we could? What if there was a way to do that? And the big question I think for me here is not just how, but how specifically do we create new and maintain existing nature while maintaining all of the modern conveniences that we know and love our, our cities and towns and communities for? How can we really make nature work in the modern world? Not how can we go back to nature, but actually how can we move forward to nature? So this, this question has really, as you can tell, has consumed me for quite a while, but academically, professionally for about the last six years. And I really wanted to uncover what are the different tools that we might be missing? And one of the big tools that I felt like was not being talked about enough was the role of emerging technologies. And I felt like every single sector had undergone some form of digital transformation, whether that was the way that we get around our city, our urban mobility, waste management, lighting, there's all these different aspects of urban life that have completely been revolutionized by technology, our healthcare, how we vote. I mean, I dare you to name me a sector that has not undergone some form of digital transformation. The only one I could come up with was ecology, nature, and specifically in urban centers. Of course, forestry has a long history of using remote sensing technologies, but I really felt like there was this huge new development in emerging technologies, whether that was big data or machine learning, blockchain, automation, sensors, drones, computer vision, these new emerging technologies. And I felt like, aha, uh -huh, if we could just figure out which one of these makes sense for urban ecology, that might be a way to actually move forward in this. And I decided to give that a name. And that name was the Internet of Nature. And it's my hopefully holistic concept for coming up with this specific classification of urban, uh, of emerging technologies that we might recognize from the smart city movement, but developing those so that they're specifically useful for mapping, monitoring, and ultimately reconnecting people to nature as well, which I believe is really a core tenant of what we're trying to do here. Um, and I wanna spend the rest of the time that we have today 
diving into specifically not just the technology, but the actual the people, some of the innovators. And I think this presentation actually ties in really well with Florencia's presentation from earlier, where she talked about these different uh, avenues of innovation that we need. I was really excited to see that many of the avenues that have come out of that research and that report and that Florencia mentioned in her presentation are really, they, they tie in really well to some of the innovators that are already happening on the ground that have been active for several years already that are doing some of this work. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to meet uh, several of these innovators, um, both through my studies and speaking and, and travels. And um, when COVID hit, and of course travel came to a stop and conferences weren't happening anymore, I felt like I wanted to do more to communicate all of these this knowledge that I was getting. So I started a podcast, which was supposed to just be a fun little pandemic project. And as these things go, they get a little bit out of hand. So we are uh, going into our fifth season already of the Internet of Nature podcast. Uh, so some of the uh, people that I'm going to be mentioning today, or perhaps actually almost all of them, have an accompanying uh, podcast episode. So if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to check that out. And as I mentioned, there's a season five in the works that's coming out in April of this year. So I'm gonna introduce you to four different innovators today and specifically what they are working on. The first innovator is Professor Vivek Chandes. And um, I got the opportunity to meet um, Vivek uh, in June of 2019 at the um, um, Nature of Our Cities uh, conference in Paris. And I got the opportunity to reconnect with him this past October in Portland, Oregon, where he's based. Um, Vivek is a, a professor at the University, um, at State University of Portland, um, where he focuses on climate adaptation and mitigation. But um, more importantly than that, or at least um, I think that's how he would put it as well, uh, he founded a company called Kappa Strategies. Now, um, Vivek has, is interested in climate mitigation as, um, as a general issue for cities, but specifically he's very interested in trying to tackle this issue of extreme heat. Now, this is something he'd been working on for, for many, many years. And when he started this work about 15 years ago, he was using satellite-based um, imagery to essentially come up with heat maps of cities, um, which would hopefully help to then inform uh, where there should be changes made. The issue with this, um, with this method is while it is highly objective, it's also incredibly coarse. And it doesn't always give a good indication of what the temperature that, that a pedestrian, somebody that's living and working on that street might feel on an incredibly hot day. And he felt like there had to be more done to come up with a hyper-local solution to that problem. Now in uh, June of 2021, this um, problem really hit home for Vivek for the very first time. As you might remember, in June of 2021, the entire Pacific Northwest, from British Columbia all the way down to California, was dealing with an extreme, extreme heat wave. They actually called it the heat dome. It was a period of extreme heat that lasted about five days. You even had temperatures that were measured in Portland that exceeded temperatures that had been measured in Las Vegas, many, many kilometers to the south of these areas. And um, Portland, of course, and many, many cities in the Pacific Northwest, although Vivek had been warning municipalities and public health authorities that temperatures could get that high, of course, could not even imagine that temperatures could ever get that high in Pacific Northwest cities. Um, this really kind of has further instigated the work that Vivek does. And that work, both through his research, but specifically via Kappa, is a program called um, Heat Watch. A Heat Watch is, um, um, is uh, essentially a program where uh, Kappa Strategies, Vivek's organization, um, enlist volunteers to install these relatively simple temperature monitors, sometimes they have air quality monitors as well, to their cars, as you can see here in the, in the top uh, left image there, that little white thing, and in the middle, uh, he's pointing to it. And then, um, well, there's one in each picture. These really kind of simple, almost looking temperature monitors. And these volunteers are asked to drive a predetermined route throughout the city um, multiple, multiple times and get these hyper, hyper local heat measurements. 
And um, they've done this, as you can see here on the picture on the map behind me, uh, in the past five years, they've done this in many places uh, around the US, and now they're starting to um, do international campaigns as well, because it is a relatively simple, um, uh, just because it's simple, of course, doesn't always mean it's easy, um, but this relatively simple campaign where you have the volunteers, again, that citizen engagement piece is, is really important. Why are we doing this? Um, and at the same time, uh, the measurements are a very objective and can be used for a number of different um, outcomes. For example, uh, this is a map of Portland. So as you can see, uh, there are certain areas here, specifically if you look at areas like uh, the train yard and the industrial areas that are, of course, bright, bright red. Now, these results, of course, when you look at the bluer results of areas that are that are park and forested, that they're a lot cooler, that's not going to surprise anyone in this room. Um, but what it does do is it provides a certain political impetus. Um, and I, I know from um, what Maria Chara was, uh, was showing as well that the um, uh, these heat maps can really offer that political impetus because it makes this connection between public health and urban forestry. And I think for, as we'll get to in the last example, for many, um, for many organizations that are maybe not as tree-minded as we might all be in this room, that can be a really important distinction to make because they start to see a return on investment like no other. Now, the, this kind of data is now being used to be able to um, inform, because again, it's so hyper-local, be able to inform where urban greenery might occur, whether that's urban forestry, whether that's green roofs, whether that's green facades. Uh, but even simpler, of course, if there are budget restraints and you're not able to do a green roof right away, to even just paint your roof white, which is another way to really help um, uh, tone down the heat in buildings. So that's Fifek. Uh, he's coming up as a guest in season five, actually. So you can look forward to him on the podcast. The second innovator I want to introduce you to is Yvonne Aki Sawyer. I see a couple of you nodding your heads. Are you familiar with Yvonne? Some of you maybe. Yvonne is the, uh, the newly or since four years now elected mayor of um, Freetown in the capital of Sierra Leone. And as you might remember in the news from 2017, shortly before Yvonne Aki Sawyer was, um, uh, was sworn into office as the new mayor, uh, a terrible, terrible uh, landslide happened in Freetown. It looked like this. Basically, uh, as a really an, an aggregation of a couple different factors. On the one hand, an unseasonably rainy, um, torrential uh, rain downpour. Um, but secondly, um, more importantly, factors such as rampant urbanization up slopes, essentially Freetown finds itself in a valley uh, covered by these very uh, kind of steep hillsides, um, rampant urbanization and coupled with that, unfortunately, rampant deforestation on these slope sides. Now, as you can imagine, if you have that coupled with a torrential downpour, that creates some pretty dangerous conditions. And that's exactly what had happened. Um, uh, People in Freetown still refer to this day as the day that the mountain, half of the mountain came down. In a matter of hours, uh, over 1,800 lives were lost, not to mention all of the property, but 1,800 lives, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a figure that I still find it very difficult to wrap my head around. Um, and of course, in absolutely gruesome, um, terrible, horrific conditions that people, had, some people lost their entire families in this way. Coming off of this, and of course, coming off of years of civil strife, uh, civil rife that um, that Freetown or in that Sierra Leone as a country was dealing with, Von Aki Sawyer was was not just um, very much pushed to want to do something practical to address this problem quite practically, but she also looked at, at tree planting as a way to bring new hope and new optimism to a city that was very clearly suffering. In fact, a little known uh, uh, a little known fact about New York is shortly after uh, the 2001 the 911 attacks uh, on the World uh, Trade um, Towers, um, the newly sworn in mayor um, Mayor Michael Bloomberg actually did a heavy investment in parks and in tree planting at that time because he he found actually that parks were one of the few places where people were really coming together and be able to grieve what happened to their city. So there's this little known um, I think. Um, 
phenomenon around urban forestry that I think it can also really help bring people together in times of intense grief and dealing with intense loss. And that was exactly what Yvonne had hoped for. Um, so she did, uh, she, she, she announced something that, of course, um, for many people uh, here might not sound very interesting. She, she launched a campaign to plant 2 million trees, which of course is becoming a very popular thing to do. But Yvonne's campaign was very different. And it was different because it was paired with an app called Tree Tracker. And Tree Tracker is an app that was developed to essentially um, not only monitor and track every single seedling and tree that was going into the ground, um, but actually be able to enlist the help of the local population and really make this a project that they felt they had ownership of. And again, adding to that, that aspect of hope and optimism, really make sure that they felt um, that, they felt that this, this project and these trees were theirs and they were gonna be part of their community, not just for the next seasons, but for generations to come. Um, what this app also allowed was the use of, of uh, mobile micropayments. So if you were elected um, or chosen or selected, I should say, as a steward for a particular tree, you would go into the app and you would, for example, you would take an action, you would water or you would prune or you would remove garbage, what have you, from the tree. You would document that with photos into the app and you would actually directly from that uh, be able to be eligible for a mobile micropayment for your action. So it was a way to also not only um, not, not only give back to the community in, in the form of these trees, but actually monetarily as well. Um, the last I heard, they are a little bit behind on their 2 million uh, tree campaign goal. Um, but I think having this be paired with such a robust monitoring plan, it is really quite different. And I think it also speaks as an interesting example. Um, oftentimes we have cities in the global south that feel like they need to look to the north Really, oh, still? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, that feel like they need to look to the north for uh, for inspiration, and I actually think this is a beautiful example of how we can do the opposite. And there's so much to learn. Um, that's innovator number two. Innovator number three, Tim Rademacher, who's here on the left um, with his uh, with his colleagues Shauna Gray Eyes and Clarice Hart, uh, and Tim Rademacher. It was a postdoctoral student at Harvard Forest, which is a, a, a research uh, preservation uh, in uh, Massachusetts, obviously linked to Harvard University. Now, um, Tim is a plant physiologist. So uh, Tim's research interest is his understanding how plants function on a physiological level. Um, and he, as he was starting to share some of his findings of his research, he specifically focuses on trees. He started to share some of these things, these really interesting things that are kind of, if any of you have read The, the Hidden Life of Trees, it's a came a very, or The Secret Life of Trees, it's sometimes called a very popular book by uh, Peter Willeben, a, a German forester. He writes about many of these, um, of these processes that trees go through um, that, that many of us might not even recognize, many of us even in the tree world might not even recognize what, what brilliantly unique organisms that we're dealing with here, how they are able to breathe in essence, how they're able to grow, how they're able to shrink, how they're able to transpire and use water, all these different facets. Um, and Tim was very inspired by this. And as he started to share some of these findings with some of his friends and colleagues, he talked about them in such an enthusiastic way. Many of his friends actually encouraged him to share some of this knowledge on social media and help spread public awareness about this knowledge. And Tim said, no, I have something better. I'm not gonna share this. I'm gonna let the tree speak for itself on social media. So he came up with this concept uh, inspired by another project out of Kent in Belgium called Tree Watch, which had set up the world's first tweeting tree. He was very inspired by that. So he set up his own um, at a witness tree. Whitney the witness tree is uh, the world's uh, oldest living organism on social media. Um, she is a 100 year old or over 100 year old oak tree in the middle of Harvard Forest. Her exact location is only known to a few, but as you can tell, she already has over uh, 10,000 followers in the number of years that she's been online. Um, I encourage you to follow her. 
And um, essentially what she does is she is, she's hooked up to a number of different sensors, specifically a dendrometer, which measures the growth of the tree, um, a sap flow, um, but also um, uh, relative humidity and temperature sensors. And uh, there's even a camera. So if you actually try this later, if you tweet at Whitney on Twitter uh, and say, Whitney, how are you doing? She'll actually say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing fine or what have you. And she'll actually tweet you back a selfie of that moment. Um, so she's, uh, you can interact with her in these different ways. Um, so Tim and his, and his colleague, um, uh, Clarice Hart, um, who runs science communication and outreach at the Harvard Forest, they started this and this is still something that Tim works on today. Um, I met Tim via a mutual friend when I was doing the, my own part of, um, my, P, my, the latter part of my PhD research at MIT, Sensible City Lab, also in Boston. I was able to meet Tim and I was super inspired by him. And as I kind of, I kept this idea in the back of my mind and I felt like, wow, it'd be so cool to do another tweeting tree, a kind of like a, another kind of Whitney, but then specifically in a city center, draw awareness to urban trees and also draw awareness to soil. So be able to use soil sensors as well. Um, because as, as, as Flo mentioned, one of the key areas of innovation within urban forestry is taking, you know, taking less of our time to look upwards and more of our time to look downwards at the very substrate that these trees are growing in and raise awareness about soil quality. And I felt like how cool if we could not only raise awareness about the importance of urban trees, but also the importance of high qu soil quality to make our urban trees work. So um, I got to work with a company um, uh, that I've been working with for, uh, for a number of years called Soil Mania in the Netherlands. They're a soil sensor company as well as Dr. Andrew Hirons, who is a tree biologist at Myers School College um, in the UK, and Mercy Forest, which is a community forest organization that ended up funding the first iteration of our own tweeting tree. So on the left here, you see uh, Bowie the birch. And uh, Bowie is a young birch tree uh, on, uh, on a campus in the center of Liverpool. And on the right here, you see uh, Dr. Andrew Hirons, um, installing one of soil mania's soil life sensors and the soil life sensor measures things like um, the temperature the oxygen levels the ph the electrical conductivity the amount of salt in the soil and moisture these five different parameters that together offer a proxy for soil health and the amount of microbial activity, for example, or nutrient availability in a soil. So there's tons of different data that you can get out of this and tons of different ways to interpret this data. In addition to um, the soil life sensor, Bowie is also hooked up to a dendrometer, so we measure her growth. Uh, there's also a sap flow sensor, so we know how much water is going through her trunk, um, and uh, a relative humidity and a temperature sensor. So a whole different array, I um, mean, she's really hooked up, um, a whole different array of different sensors. And based on, this, on these sensors, um, Andrew and I have developed a number of different tweets and essentially when Bowie's um, metrics reach certain levels, a tweet is picked out from uh, a tweet that would function or fit with those different metrics is picked out from a from a bucket. We've automated this system, and then a tweet will go out to describe what Bowie might be going through in that moment. So Bowie might say things like, "My toes are dry. Anyone know if it'll rain soon?" Or, "I'm in my happy place. Soil moisture is at 26.2%." and temperature is at 16.5 Celsius. Or when my pH is too high, I find it hard to access nutrients. Right now my pH is at 7.62, not good. So really being able to raise awareness, not about the importance of urban forestry, but also again about soil quality and how imperative that is to make urban forests work. Now, this is another tweeting tree. Both Tim and I uh, and Andy and other people that are involved in this project, um, we really envision a world where we have an entire network of tweeting trees. We would love it if one day these trees were able to tweet at each other, maintain some kind of social network. And my big dream would be to even one day have a tree that has so many social media followers that they could also be maybe even be considered a social media influencer. How amazing would it be for society as a whole if we not only, um, you know, had the Kardashians and what have you as our social media influencers, but actual trees that of course our life is sustained upon. What would that mean for society if we looked up to these kinds of organisms and put them on a pedestal, um, if you will.
So one way that, um, that we're scaling this is we've come up with a tweeting tree kit. So this is something that Soil Mania sells. Um, uh, and if you're interested in this at all, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, where we basically, we've bundled this sensor array and also this piece of the software and the writing of the sensor rules and the tweet, the company tweets that go with it, uh, with the automatic system that turns the data uh, from the sensors uh, into use of, uh, sorry, that turns the, the, the measurements from the sensors into usable data, translates the data into the tweets, that piece of software, we've bundled that together so that we can really have this as a product so that we can make it a lot easier for uh, not only municipalities, but maybe hospitals, schools, universities, other institutions that might want a tweeting tree of their own. I mean, how fabulous would it be if every single city had its tree mascot, if you will, in the same way that they might have for their sports team or their university, that they also have um, a digital Lorax that is not speaking, but tweeting for all the other trees in a neighborhood or in a city. I think that would be a pretty cool to, uh, to accomplish. So let's see how we do. Um, Bowie was just launched. Um, uh, we did a soft launch about eight months ago now. We're going for a hard launch uh, this upcoming spring. Uh, but Bowie is already live on Twitter. Uh, not yet 10,000 followers, but um, please uh, help us along and give Bowie a follow if you're, uh, if you're still uh, on Twitter. Um, and the last innovator I'll introduce you to is uh, Jared Hanley. And uh, Jared, um, I was introduced to Jared by uh, another mutual colleague that we shared. And Jared is a former um, adventure racer, meaning that he finds it a good time to subject himself to these two week, 10 day extreme races all around the world where you're doing mountaineering and biking and climbing and hiking and running uh, and you're surviving basically um, in the wilderness for two weeks at a time. Uh, so he did this in his free time uh, and from Monday to Friday, nine to five, he worked as a data scientist. And he knew like no other, the power that, that spending that much time in nature, that kind of a nature exposure, what it does to you, what it does to your overall health and well-being. And he essentially, he wanted to find a way to quantify this. Um, so he developed um, his first product together with his team and they're based out of, um, out of Eugene and also in Oregon. And he called that nature score. And essentially, if we recognize that nature is so important to our health and well-being, it follows that we need to find a way to objectively quantify how the nature scores around us. But of course, we already have metrics like NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which is a very common index that's used in remote sensing to come up with a measure of greenness in an area. But of course, just greenness doesn't encapsulate everything that nature has to offer. For example, water, open bodies of water, using the NDVI uh, index, they're actually discounted. Water is seen as equal to concrete, according to an NDVI. That's a big problem, of course, because we know now from the research that have being close to water, whether you're just looking at it or whether you're swimming in it, is extremely, extremely beneficial and therapeutic to your health. So essentially what Nature Score does is it takes a whole different um, range of data sets, whether that's remote sensing or uh, GIS land use information, or even things like Google Street View or noise quality, um, uh, air quality data, combines those all together and comes up with a score that gives you an objective measurement of how well the nature around you scores, what is the quality of the natural elements around you, but factoring in the positive health benefits. So how much health boosting nature do you have around you? Essentially what I'm saying is if you have the water around you, if you have trees around you, greenness around you, those are all gonna score, score very high. If you have a lot of impervious surface around you, you're gonna get a lower score. Now, this nature score map is available for all of the US at the moment um, and, uh, and Canada and Europe um, at the moment. Uh, we're working on, on other regions as well. It's already being used by organizations like um, the White House, the American White House, um, to essentially be able to prioritize, not just they prioritize a lot of their uh, public investments based on areas of lower socioeconomic status, they're the first administration actually to consider, can we also make investments in civil infrastructure um, in communities based on nature deficiency? And they're using the nature score map to make that happen. 
Um, the Arbor Day Foundation, which is one of the largest nonprofit organizations around the world focusing on planting and sustaining existing trees, uh, they're also using it. They have a massive goal to plant 500 million trees in the next five years to celebrate their 50th anniversary. You can see what they did there, 550, 500, yep. And, um, and they wanna use, uh, they're using this map to essentially prioritize what are the areas in the communities of greatest need for us to be able to focus those efforts. Now, I'll just leave you with one last example. Jared and his team were, they wanted to know not just how did nature score around them, but also how can we actually encourage people to get out in that nature, right? We need to do more than just have it around us. We need to actually be making use of it. We need to, as human beings, be spending more time outside, more time exposed to nature to really be able to get all of those benefits. But if I ask this whole room, how can you tell me how much time you spent in nature last week? I don't think any of you could probably give me a good answer. Um, and that is exactly why they developed Nature Dose on top of the Nature Score map. And essentially what Nature Dose is, it's a tracker, much like a step counter for nature, like something that might count your steps, like a Fitbit. Um, it's based on your GPS location, following your location based on where you've been. And it gives you an aggregation of how many minutes you spent inside, outside, and of those minutes outside, exposed to nature. And as you can imagine, outside and nature exposure does not automatically mean the same thing. Um, essentially, it works in the background. So it really, it's not meant to, uh, that it has your, that, that your, has your attention. It's really meant similar to a step counter to work in the background. Uh, and before you ask, they don't keep your GPS location data. They only use the minutes that you are outside and inside in case you're wondering what they're doing privacy-wise with that. Now, I, again, like allowing ourselves to think a little bit bigger and broaden our horizons here, what could that, what would a society that on massive, massive scale was um, not only stimulated, but perhaps even rewarded through their employers, through their school, through their institutions, through their health insurance companies to spend more time outside? What if Nature Dose became this fourth ring on the Apple Watch that we not only focused on how many calories we were burning and how many steps we were taking and how many times we stood up per day, but that we actually, this idea of, have you had your Nature Dose today? Oh, I didn't get mine. Let's go together. Let, let's go get our Nature Dose together. Have you had your coffee yet? No, let's go for a Nature Dose. That this really becomes part of the public discourse, that it becomes part of the mainstream. What would a society look like that en masse prioritize this aspect of their lives. I think it's something interesting to think about. I will leave you with one last point, and that is that despite all of these really exciting emerging technologies uh, that are happening within the internet of nature and these inspiring innovators that are leading that charge and, and really leading this new school of thinking, I think it's important to remember that it's always about the outcome. The outcome, I think, I think we can all agree on here, both all of us in this room and everyone online, that we want the same thing, which is a healthy, just, green place to live for both us, for our children, and all the other species that we share our cities with. That is, that is the outcome that we all want. The goal is not here to have technology be a replacement for nature in any way. In fact, I think that is completely the opposite direction that we need to go. I do think, however, is that we've, we've gotten to a place where we've been really easy to write off technology. And I understand that. Often it feels like nature and technology should not even belong in the same sentence. But by writing off technology completely, I believe that we are losing a critical tool that could help us get to that outcome that we all share. And that might actually mean that one day, many of the technologies that I described today might actually become obsolete. If you take nature dose, for example, and if we really follow that to its, to its extreme and we got people so engaged in getting their daily nature dose, at one point they're gonna realize that they actually don't have that much nature around them. And that frustrates them because it's difficult for them to get their nature dose, difficult for them to meet their weekly goal. Maybe that is the final instigator that they need to have nature be more around them. Before they know it, they've partnered with organizations like Wow Nature to make this all happen around them. And they realize that just by going to the store or by dropping their kids off at school or by going to work, they've doubled or tripled or quadrupled their nature dose for the day. They don't even look at the app anymore because they know that they've already hit their target. That might make something like nature dose obsolete in many ways that 
um, that maybe even it's secretly my hope that we don't need these technologies. But I think for the situation that we're in now, the urgent situation that resides us in, I think we need to look at all the tools that we have available. And I'll leave you with one last quote from James Howard Kussler, who we started this presentation with and who really inspired my journey um, to get into this field. And that is that human settlements are like living organisms. They must grow and they will change, but we can decide on the nature of that growth on the quality and the character of it and where it ought to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadina. I believe we do have some questions. Wait, who, who was that? Oh, James Howard Kunstler. Yeah. Yes, yeah, he, uh, he is, he is, yeah, yeah. I, um, I finally got the nerve to reach out to him personally, thinking that like, you know, he'll never reply to my email. And that since then we've had like a nice email correspondence. So it's, uh, it's been very nice, yeah. Okay, so uh, we actually don't have much time for the questions, but uh, maybe we can start from the uh, from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, so the first one is: Can we find Nature Dose in Android? Yes, yeah, uh, iPhone and Android. But I, I Nature Score is available for those three uh, places that I mentioned. But Nature Dose at the moment is only in the U.S. Sorry, I'm in Europe and I should have said that. So yes, iPhone and Android, but currently only in the USA. We're working to change that very soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, could the tweeting uh, tree kit also be used for wild berry heads? Sure, why not? Especially if it's about uh, if it's about the soil quality in general, then I could I could see that being used. The tweeting wild berry hedge, sure. Yeah, we could make that work. Okay, uh, then these two. From Daniel, uh, hi Nadina, will there be a recording and a link that I can send to some people in situ administration and some NGOs? Thanks and best wishes. And then, uh, I don't know if this question is again for you, but does anyone know about citizen science projects and mapping? Uh, Island, yeah, for yeah. forest, green plant associations, companion planting in cities. Um, oh, Daniel likes his berry hedges. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> um, Citizen science, um, yeah, I, th I think honestly a good place to start would probably be the U Forest website with a number of the resources and the case studies that we have there. Um, that might be a good place to start and specifically with um, Wow Nature might actually have a couple of these case studies as well. Um, and in terms of the recording and the link, that's a, that's a question for you guys, I think so. Uh, yes, the yeah. recording of, of uh, today will be... Uh uploaded on the website so you will uh, you will find it there mm -hmm. um okay okay these were just comments okay i think okay this then is ian answering to okay, the previous questions i believe yeah uh, questions from uh, the room uh Daniel, okay a link to the um a link to the tweeting tree kit um so i encourage you to go to soilmania.com uh there click on tree mania and then you go to products and services and there you'll find uh information on the tweeting tree kit uh there's also an infographic on that page that you can download that has all kinds of information uh daniel and anyone else if you can't find it uh just email me, my contact information is on my website, nadinahollett.com, um, if you can't find it, but it, you should find, if you type, if you Google Soil Mania Tweeting Tree Kit, you can't miss it. Okay, and then maybe this one, in which department were you at WR? Oh, at Wageningen? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't even mention that I was at Wageningen, but I did, uh, <laughs> I did technically do my master's thesis there. I did my master's at the University of Amsterdam, and then I did my thesis in Wageningen. Uh, I was in uh, plant production systems, uh, I believe it's called, but that was a long time ago, Giovanni. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Daniel. That's it. <laughs> okay. So thank you, everybody. And if Marisa, you want to wrap uh, well, up? Guys, thank you so much for being here today. I really hope uh, you enjoy this uh, long morning together with uh, you, Forest, uh, and uh, especially with, uh, with Nadina among uh, all our guests and speakers. Uh, we encourage you to follow all our activities from now up to the end of the year because the project is going to uh, last uh, the whole year. We have uh, activities such as uh, the tree planting campaign as you see uh, from Lara. Uh, we were going actually to plant the tree in four uh, cities. Uh, so there would be actually um, uh, rare fundraising uh, uh, that Wow Nature will do. Um, we will work uh, together with the uh, ERPA, uh, Foresta, Me, and Well Nature. We work together with the tree planting campaign. Students uh, will start next next week uh, to actually work together on um, uh, the capstone course. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of uh, projects uh, going on and uh, workshops uh, uh, all together. With, there will be a specific workshop with the technicians. Uh, that will be um, um, AirSAP is organizing. Uh, um, Italian. Sorry? Italian. In, in Italian. In Italian. In so uh, we really hope you will follow us and you will interact with us. Um, a PhD student uh, uh, is going to write us, uh, she or he, I don't know, uh, wrote us uh, before. So we are very happy to interact also with students and uh, uh, researchers that want to discover more of what we've done and what we're going to do. Um, so thank you very much for all of you to be part of this event. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.